Feminism can get a bad rap. Male critics perceive feminists as man-hating, tyrannical matriarchs who wish nothing more than to use imagined terms like patriarchy to justify their disdain. Those within the movement may see others as only using the label for virtue signaling, pointing to a lack of coherence and progress in defining feminism. The task of defining and pursuing a feminism that accounts for these critiques is quite tricky. Thankfully, there's bell hooks. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Isn't the night sky just crazy? Over a hundred billion galaxies containing hundreds of billions of stars? How do you even begin to learn about this stuff? Thankfully, I have Brilliant to turn to. Brilliant is a fun and interactive online community with an insane amount of STEM-related courses to fuel your curiosity about the world around you. With Brilliant, anyone can understand concepts about science, math, and coding. Their interactive puzzles and quizzes allow for an easy and fun path towards learning real problem solving, no matter the topic. I've been having a fun time going through Brilliant's astrophysics course. I've learned a great deal about the elements that compose the world around us, the trajectory of the celestial bodies, and even exoplanet detection. I can definitely say that this course has quenched my interest in the wonders of the universe. Visit the link in the description below to get started learning STEM for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium subscription on Brilliant. Born as Gloria Jean Watkins, Bell Hooks grew up in a small segregated town where she struggled to find her identity in a rich magical world of southern black culture that was sometimes paradisiacal and at other times terrifying. To deal with this, she would read an insane amount, eventually pursuing a BA in English from Stanford and an MA in English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. During this time, she would begin a 10-year project writing the book, Ain't I a Woman, Black Women, and Feminism. This book had a profound impact on the world when it was finally published in 1981. In it, she examines the double oppression of black women who experience both racism and sexism. She argues that these twin towers of domination that began in slavery led to black women having the lowest status and worst conditions out of any minority in the US. This is partially explained by the blind spots in white female abolitionists who preferred to associate with black male abolitionists rather than females. Specifically, she notes that slavery led to the stereotype of black female promiscuity, which generalized white women as pure goddess virgins and black women as seductive stereotypes that were historically used to define all women. This shift was used to justify the exclusion of black women from sharing their perspectives. Hooks then turns to black nationalism, criticizing it as being patriarchal and misogynist. She notes that the movement readily took up the idea of the black matriarch, which argues that the position of black women in the family has led to a psychological castration of the black male, and from this, the downfall of the black family. This has once again resulted in the exclusion of black women from being taken seriously. Finally, Hooks turns to the feminist movement. She views feminism as largely failing to represent the needs of the poor and non-white women. This in turn enabled further sexism, racism, and classism. She calls for a more inclusive and representative form of feminism that will give black women a chance to be represented. The book was critically acclaimed, especially in its novel ability to correlate the history of slavery of black women and the ripple effects of this oppression in modern American society. However, the book was also criticized for being unscholarly in its absence of bibliography. Although Hooks explains that such a strategy is necessary to encourage as wide an audience as possible, others such as Keisha and Nicole Abraham have argued that this shows that Hooks considers her audience to be lazy and unsophisticated. Hooks would go on to publish over 30 books ranging in topics from black men, patriarchy, to love and self-improvement. Aside from a controversial anti-American commencement speech she gave shortly after 9-11, Hooks mostly kept herself out of the spotlight. In 2017, she would confess that she had been celibate for 17 years, 
And although she would like a partner, she didn't feel like her life was any less meaningful without someone. She would pass away from kidney failure at the age of 69. Due to her many interests, Hooke's philosophy encapsulates several interesting topics. Regarding feminism, Hooks provides a critique and her own system of feminism. She argues that feminism has largely lost its radical potential and its intimate connection with radical individualism. For Hooks, feminism does not mean that a woman can do whatever they want and have it all. Instead, being a feminist involves undertaking specific daily actions. From this, she claims that there are actually very few true feminists. This radical individualism, she believed, was a response to the inability for feminism to find solid definition. The central problem within feminist discourse has been our inability to either arrive at a consensus of opinion about what feminism is, or accept definitions that could serve as points of unification. Without agreed-upon definitions, we lack a sound foundation on which to construct theory or engage in overall meaningful praxis. Her definition goes beyond the simplistic definition that fighting for equality equals feminism. As she writes, implicit in this simplistic definition of women's liberation is a dismissal of race and class as factors that, in conjunction with sexism, determine the extent to which an individual will be discriminated against, exploited, or oppressed. Thus, Hooks advocates for a feminism for everybody that includes all those who are exploited. Her definition, clearly stated, is the movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. This definition moves away from the anti-male sentiment of some feminist discourse. She makes clear that the problem is sexism, a view that all genders have been socialized from birth to accept and justify. As she writes, Females can be just as sexist as men, and while that does not excuse or justify male domination, it does not mean that it would be wrong-minded for feminist thinkers to see the movement as simplistically being for women against men. This revolutionary feminism seeks to end not only sexism, but also class elitism and imperialism. In total, the movement is concerned with ending oppression, which she defines also quite clearly. Being oppressed means the absence of choice. It is the primary point of contact between the oppressed and the oppressor. This line of thinking is used in her stance on abortion, arguing that granting women control over their body, the power to make a choice, is a basic feminist principle. Whether one wishes to undergo an abortion is purely a matter of choice, but the choice itself is the principle. Expanded on a larger scale, this project against oppression is seen in her views of the patriarchy. Compared to other feminists, Hooks does not see patriarchy as the totaling structure of domination. Rather, patriarchy functions as a subservient to class structure. She argues that white women tend to see class exploitation as the offspring of the parent system of the patriarchy within the feminist movement in the West. This has led to the assumption that resisting patriarchal domination is more legitimate feminist action than resisting racism and other forms of domination. To end patriarchal domination should be of primary importance to women and men globally not because it is the foundation of all other oppressive structures, but because it is that form of domination we are more likely to encounter in an ongoing way in everyday life. This involves the insight that we are all participants in perpetuating the system and so she abandons the misandrous discourse that tends to drive men away from feminism. This inclusivity expands to Hooke's famous contribution to the field, intersectionality. Rather than arguing that all systems of oppression are rooted in the patriarchy, Hooke sees an interlocking system of various oppressions that impact people differently based upon where they are located on the basis of class, sex, race, and gender. To represent the multidimensionality of these relations, she equips the term imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. What is one tool to combat these systems of oppression? Hooks places love and communion above and beyond anything else. Because of this, she's also its harshest critic. Hooks sees the female obsession of love as a product of socialization, in the false assumption that we will find love in the place where femaleness is deemed unworthy and consistently devalued. We learn early to pretend that love matters more than anything, when in actuality we know that what matters most, even in the wake of the feminist movement, is patriarchal approval. 
Feminism requires a new way to think about love, beyond its general advice to stop thinking about it or live as though love does not matter. She sees this as yet another product of oppression, the fear of becoming the woman who loves too much. For Hooks, love is integral to human life and the actualization that allows for freedom. Love is a transformational force, demanding of each individual accountability and responsibility for nurturing our growth. It is the basic desire to make our survival a shared effort. For Bell Hooks, she sees this lack of emphasis on love in progressive circles as an over-preoccupation with material concerns. This only further encourages an ethic of domination. She turns back to the words of Martin Luther King Jr., who preached the ethic of love as the one true hope for peace and freedom in the world. King believed that love is ultimately the only answer to the problems facing this nation and the entire planet. I share that belief and the conviction that it is in choosing love and beginning with love as the ethical foundation for politics that we are best positioned to transform society in ways that enhance the collective good. Choosing love, we also choose to live in community, and that means that we do not have to change by ourselves. Although bell hooks may be poorly received as too forgiving in some progressive circles, I believe that her discourse on love, inclusivity, and the turning away from an us versus them mentality is a useful reminder for those who wish to make effective change in a world so bogged down by division, polarization, and hatred.